Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Pastor Tom is here uh, for his, the next message in the Book of Nehemiah series. Before we get to that, we have so much happening in the life of our church coming up. want to let you know of all the great things coming up in the next month and a bit. First thing, just a reminder that our missions focus for this month is the Operation Christmas Child Shoeboxes. You can pick up a physical box from the church, or you can pack a shoebox virtually online. If you are packing a physical box, please have it back to the church by Sunday, November the 14th for National Collection Week. Now, for all of the women in our church, so much happening in the next month and a half for you. Starting in November, on the 12th, we have our Craft Together uh, women's group starting up again. You can contact Francine or the church office for more information on that. On November 19th, Sarah's going to be launching a book club to walk through the design Design Your Life book by Kirsten Jones that was gifted to our women earlier this year. If you'd like to know how to get, get involved in that book club, please contact the church office. And then on Saturday, December the 4th, uh, the ladies' Christmas tea is back. There'll be an in-person and an online option. If you're interested in getting involved in that, want to know all the details on time, cost, etc., contact the church office or Faith Kroll as our women's team leader. It's going to be so glad, uh, so good to have that event back on the calendar again this year. Now, speaking of Christmas, if you are looking for something to fill every day in December with some merry fun, we have a Christmas Advent activity countdown for all the people in our church. There is a digital copy available on our church website, or starting this Sunday, you can print up, pick up a printed booklet and begin to plan how you're going to spend every single day in December. We can't wait to be doing that together as a church. Last thing. Hopefully I haven't forgotten anything. Last thing. Sunday, November the 21st, we are so pleased to have Steve Faulkner, the president of the Foursquare Gospel Church of Canada, and his wife Andy as our special guest in church that morning. Steve will be bringing the word as well as being here in official capacity to pray over me as the incoming lead pastor and to ordain me uh, for that role. So it's going to be a wonderful day to celebrate together as a church for what's happening in the life of our church, to hear from our president and to celebrate together. Now, I think that's everything. Pastor Tom is coming up next. Are you ready? Are you excited? Church starts now. So I once said to myself, what's my favorite book? And it happens to be whatever one I'm reading, whatever one I'm preaching from. So as we round the corner on this, this series on Nehemiah, Today is, again, another one of those very important things that we need to take a look at that is all about the restoration. Now, I'm going to start with prayer, but I want to give you a picture. As I was praying today about this message, I had this picture in the spirit world that, that it's very easy with this topic for people to come in with their fingers in their ears and their, their um, eyes covered up and not to be able to see or to see or hear through a preconceived notion or through a lens or a way of thinking. So this morning, I would like for us, or tonight, whenever you're watching this, I want to pray that there will be a real freedom for you to consider what is being said and to be able to hear not only the words, but the heart be behind that. So let's pray. Father God, as we come before you, whether it's in the morning or it's in the evening, Lord, we thank you that your word is always meant to be life-giving. Lord, I would pray today that you would help us to take um, the, our fingers out of our ears, not just physically, but spiritually, and with our, our, our carnal mind or our, our mental abilities. And Lord, that our hearts will be open, Lord, as, as this is a, a message that will be challenging, hopefully in a good way, because we have said that truth is freeing and not binding. So, Lord, we invite you to speak to us today through this message. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've entitled uh, this uh, section, uh, Stability Requires Sustainability. Stability Requires Sustainability. So I love the fact that a series provides those of us who, who, who preach and teach, it provides us the opportunity to push into some areas that are very important, uh, but instead of being something like, oh, I've got to make sure that people hear this, a series allows us to, to hit topics that can be challenging to some degree, but are also freeing. That's where we are today. 
So as we go through this, again, I've asked you to put aside your preconceived notions, and there needs to be a shift of our mindset today or tonight uh, so that we're not looking at this uh, from our earthly perspective, but we're looking at it through internal, our, our eternal perspective. So you might say, oh my goodness, what is he going to talk about today? Is this an incoming sermon? Incoming! Or is it the good news? Well, I want to put this into perspective, as Pastor Danny said last week, that in our English uh, Bibles, the, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, they are broken into two different books. But in reality, they're really one and the same. Nehemiah was the restorer and the rebuilder. Ezra was the teacher and the one who was saying, this is what the Word of God says, and we need in this restoration time, we need to realign our thought processes and our behaviors in keeping with what God's Word is saying. It's not our opinions, but it's what is God's Word saying, and we have a responsibility, and we have the privilege of saying we want to live our lives in a way that God can bless us. Now, I want to um, quote my beloved Lottie, and she used to, she was my greatest critic in a good way, and she said to me, she encouraged me, she said, Tom, do not withhold spiritual information that will change people's lives for the better. So she speaks from eternity, and she and I can hear her in my my. She lined me up on more than one occasion, and she says, "Tom, do not fail to share with people just because you think it might be uncomfortable for them, information, spiritual information that will actually change their lives for the better." And I want you to know that I am fully convicted of that fact. That this is not an incoming sermon. Oh, look out! But this is good news, and I'm really excited to share what God's laid on my heart. Well, first of all, um, as you know, I like words. And I want to ask this question about stability. Where is your source? Where is my source? Where is our source for stability in very unstable times? And we need to wrestle with God's part in, in providing stability and our part there is this relationship between what we do and what God is doing. And so what happens is we are looking for stability, but sometimes we're looking for stability with our natural minds, and then we're wondering why things are falling apart. God has given his good news, not only in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. He says, I want you to know how you can live your life in a way that will bring stability and sustainability to your life. Now, sustainability... I looked it up in the dictionary. I like words. And sustainability says this. It's, it's able to be used without being used up or depleted. And able to last or continue for a long time. So when Nehemiah was talking about rebuilding Jerusalem, it wasn't just a slipshod, shoddy thing where they just kind of threw things together. He says, oh, it only has to last for 20 or 30 years. But they were building something that they wanted to be both stable and sustainable. Now, again, I want you to keep that in your mind. S sustainable and stability are two concepts that are inextricably entwined in this message for all of us today. Then I looked up the word sustainability, and it, and it says it, it, it keeps on, and we don't, it doesn't get used up. And so we talk in terms now in this green world of sustainable energy. Big, big, big news item about electric cars versus fossil fuels. We need sustainable energy because at some point we have what's called the Humboldt curve, and some people have been saying, have we hit that, where there comes a point where we hit the actual apex of something, and then forever after it's on the downhill slope. There is a finite amount of, of fossil fuels. What are we going to do? How can we discover something that will be sustainable? We talk about sustainable agriculture methods. And again, I grew up in a farming community and uh, read about the Dust Bowl in the 30s in the United States, the Dust Bowl, and, and that the way that they were farming uh, pre the Dust Bowl was not sustainable. And so they had to say, how do we conserve the soil? How do we make sure that we're not depleting it to the point of no return? So Nehemiah, his mandate to rebuild and restore was to also establish stability and sustainability. Nehemiah, he continued his reforms. He encouraged change 
while addressing things that needed to be put back in place for the restoration to not only endure, but to be something that would bring a blessing. So I want to just once more say to all of us, myself included, that God's plan for you is a good one. God's plan for you is not somehow to serve him in this twisted kind of way that God is somehow this needy, creepy God that's saying, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. But I want you to know that I, I have built my life on this reality is that God, when he asks us to do things, it's not about him. It's because he loves us and he desires for us to live lives that he can bless. One of my mentors, Ron Mel, used to say, if you want to be blessed, be blessable. So that runs in the background of this entire sermon today is that I'm trying to encourage all of us in this rebuilding and restoring of the local church and in this new season, the world that we knew post uh, pre, pre COVID-19 no longer exists and there needs to be much rebuilding and restoring. It's been a place for us to poke our heads up and saying, is this working? Is this stability or is it temporary? Is it sustainable? Or are we, in fact, depleting things and we're going to end up in big trouble? Now, there's three places here that I see this, these crucial areas of rebuilding and restoring. First of all, we saw, and Pastor Danny and I, we've been talking about, one is that there's this physical safety, that they rebuilt the walls and they restored the gates. And we said this is a metaphor that the people had come back to the place of Jerusalem, but it was not safe. Physically, it was not safe from enemies, that the walls had been torn down, the gates had been burned with fire. And so one of the very first things that Nehemiah set to do was to reestablish physical safety by rebuilding walls. That means they once were there and they had been torn down. And the gates, again, were, were portals that allowed the good things in and kept the bad things out. So both of those things were important. So we've unpacked that. And if you say, well, I, I kind of dropped into the middle of this series. The wonderful thing about YouTube is you can go back and you can see all over again what we talked about. Second thing is that there was the restoration and the rebuilding of spiritual safety. And there was repentance and acknowledging that the word of God was alive and living. And it was something for telling us how God is wanting us to respond to him. Again, not because he's this dictator or cruel taskmaster, but it is about the fact that God cares for us. And he wants to say, this is how you live your life so that your life works. Now, again, I'm not trying to attack anybody. This is, again, one of those places I'm asking you to listen with open ears. I want to ask you this question. You, can, you alone can answer this. Is your life working? Is your life working? Are you being informed by this culture, or are we being informed by the culture of the kingdom of God. And again, that's a whole other sermon. But let me tell you that the culture of this world and the culture of the kingdom of God are very different. And the culture of the kingdom of God, it sometimes seems counterintuitive. And we're going to get to that as we get deeper into this message. But the reality is, are we going to trust that God is predictably good? Are we going to trust that God is going to bless when we order our lives in keeping with what he is asking us to do. Physical safety, spiritual safety. Now here's where we get to the point where this might be a little bit tough. But again, I want you to listen to this through the ears of God wants your life to work and he wants you to live in a way that he can bless. So the, the last part of this was financial stability. And so what we see here, and we're going to look at this, that Nehemiah called the people out and said, look, you are not ordering your financial affairs in a way that is sustainable and is God-honoring and about putting God first. Now, this is an integral part of rebuilding the faith community, was helping people to really understand what their true priorities were and were they committed to contributing to the work of the kingdom of God? Now, people say, well, I give my time. Well, I've said this. You've heard me say this. If you want to know what's really important to any person, see where they spend their time, where they spend their money, and what they talk about. 
So the reality is it's not an either or. Well, I give my time so I don't have to give my financial resources to the furthering of the kingdom of God. It is not a binary equation. It's not either or, but both and. But again, you might say, well, how can I do this? Well, hopefully, I want to start to plow some fields that perhaps have, have been forgotten and start saying, are we really going to trust that God is our source and he is the one for our provision? So again, coming back to a word that we have been using over and over again about community. So community and contributing are one and the same. I am su suggesting to you, based on the word of God and my experience, that if you're going to be part of community, you're going to be a person who contributes. That that's all part of it, that people working together. And again, I, I grew up in a farming community and, and, you know, up and down the Crooked Run Valley, uh, very close to where I grew up, that if one of the farmers, if they got sick or one of them ended up in the hospital at harvest time, all of the other farmers in the community contributed. They contributed their time and they contributed their resources and they contributed their gas and they would harvest that field. Why? Because they were in community because you never knew it might be them the next time. So community and contributing are part of the same equation, the same spiritual truth, and the same place of living our life in a way that God can bless. Now, it's taken me a while to get into this, but our, our, our text for today is Nehemiah chapter 10 and verse 37. And here is what the people said. We will not neglect the house of our God. We will not neglect the house of our God. Again, I went to my dictionary. So neglect has different meanings, but it says to neglect is to give little attention or respect to something of importance. It is to disregard. And so my concern is, are we neglecting putting God first in every aspect of our lives, including our finances? Are we living our lives in keeping with God's eternal principles so that he can bless. And we're going to see further on in this as we honor him. He is the one who multiplies or are we trying to do this in our own strengths and our own abilities? Now, again, I, I jokingly said, you know, my time here as lead pastor is is coming to an end. Um, I'm still going to be here. I still hope to be on the preaching team occasionally. But the reality is that I am not doing this for me, but I am saying I have uh, invested 39 years of my life in this faith community called Sunshine Hills Church. We have wept. We've been on our knees um, in times of difficulty. God has been has provided, but God uses people like you and me. We are part of the community, and we are ordering our lives in a way that God can bless, and it's not my opinion. This is what the Word of God says. So if you are having a struggle with this, I want you to know that we are here to help you. And if you say, hey, man, I don't know how to even go about doing this. This sounds awful or whatever i want you to know that you know i'm open to hey you know call me we'll sit here like you know i'm, I'm meeting people up here at the church now uh, for obvious reasons but if you say hey can you help me we have helped so many people to be able to arrange their life in a way that is in keeping with god's word and they say i can't believe that as i have begun to be on obedient with to, to god with my time, my talents, and my treasures, I cannot believe the order and the balance sustainable and stable. As we go through this, um, I looked up the word, um, I, I, you know, neglect, and another one is to leave undone or undid, unattended, especially through carelessness. So what I'm saying here, part of stability and sustainability requires that we are paying attention to things. That's all part of this, is not disregarding and not neglecting or leaving undone those things. And so my encouragement to you is so many people I talk to, you know, it's those other guys, not you. But so those other people says, well, I just can't keep in tr track of my money or I just can't keep track of my time or, you know, blah, 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 blah. And my, my life seems very chaotic. Well, again, this whole series of Nehemiah is all about us saying, let's look at these patterns and these principles that happened with this faith community thousands of years ago. And let's say, how do we 
so see those see those things and how do we incorporate them because the word of god is living so what is this house of the lord it says not neglecting god's house well it includes people that means that part of not neglecting the house of the Lord, it's not a physical place, although I have observed when, when faith communities start to deteriorate and break down, that things just become cluttered and, you know, they, they become run down. And, and again, I'm grateful for the fact that I look around here today. We're in this, the auditorium here, and, you know, we keep it painted. We, you know, we put a new carpet on and the carpet started to look shabby. But it's not about physical things. It's about people. We have said this over and over again, that the church is people, always first and foremost. But it is also about the ministries that are a part of what we do here. So the church, it is sustained by people like you and me who are honoring God with our tithes and our offerings. Now, misplaced priorities um, are not something new. And what we're going to see is that the Levites, that's the people who would be akin to our pastors and the people who, are, who make all of this um, happen in the natural, that because the people were not honoring God with their first reach, their tithes, and their offerings, that the Levites had to go back out to the fields and they couldn't give themselves to the things that God was asking of them. I want to park that. We'll come back to that. So these misplaced priorities, it's, it's a challenge throughout the Old Testament and Haggai, 1, 3 to 11, here's what happens. The prophet Haggai, he said, you guys are living in penal houses while the house of the Lord remains a ruin. Now, again, we're not talking about a physical place here. We're talking about a living, breathing house of God that is you and me so that we are giving ourselves to seeing the kingdom of God furthered and we are, as it were, putting our money where our mouth is. So Haggai, through the Spirit, says, give careful way, thought to your ways. Again, there's this intentionality. Stability and sustainability requires intentionality. It says, you're putting your money in purses with holes. Does that sound familiar? For, you know, those of you who've been around for a while, I wrote a book about all I believe to be true about, about God's plan for how we can cooperate with him. But pur purses with holes is, is that when you have holes in your pockets and you're putting money in and it's just leaking out. Why? Because there's purses with holes. We're not putting our resources in places that are going to be safe and are going to accrue and increase for the furthering of the kingdom of God. And the good news is, as we do that, God blesses us. It's not a one-way street. And let me tell you something. God is a debtor to no man. And I can tell you this. I, I'm, I'm coming 65 in a couple of days. And I want you to know that God has proven himself over and over and over again where he has, he has rewarded um, Lottie and I in all of those years. We have more than I thought we ever would, but it was because we put God first. And the reality is, I'm giving you the good news. That can be your reality. That can be your reality. That's the good news. And so it says, while each of you are busy with his own home, it says that the heavens have withheld their dew in the crops because you have priorities in the wrong spot. Now, that's a bit tough. Please stay with me. Now, in Nehemiah 13, uh, 10 to 14, here's what, what, what Nehemiah says to the people. He calls them out. He says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service have gone back to their own fields. So he said, I rebuked the officials and asked him, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. So he said, okay, we need to start getting this financial piece in place. So my concern, and again, um, this, is, this is because I care about this place, but I care about the people of the place. I care about the church, not the physical, organizational, administrative side of this, but I care about the fact that we want the ministry of Sunshine Hills Forest Square Church to be both stable and sustainable. And my concern here is by our not following God's order and putting him first in everything we do, including our money, the reality is that there is this withholding. And it's like, like saying to the farmer, you know, again, I grew up in a farming community. Well, I'm going to just trust God for the crops to come in next year, but they don't plant anything. That that's what we do. We plant our, our first fruits, our tithes and offerings in the soil of faith, and we trust that we will gain the increase, 30, 60, and 100-fold. 
And I want you to know something that I, I have lived my life by that. I was a five-year-old kid. My dad gave me 50 cents a week. You know, I had a, a nice big 50 cent piece. And my dad, when he first announced, he says, Tommy, he said, I want, to, I want to teach you something, that this is your income, and a nickel of that belongs to Jesus. Can you do that? He says, you get 45 cents, and you, you know, God owns that five, five cents. And as you learn this principle, you'll see how God comes through for you. God didn't need a, a five-year-old's nickel, but he did need that, that five-year-old's obedience and faith. And he, my dad, through the power of the Spirit, sowed something into my life about honoring God. I want to sow that into you. And you say, I don't know how to go about doing that. We can help you. You know, start someplace. Start someplace. If, so if you say, hey, I, I'm gonna, I, can't, I don't feel I can give 10% right now and a tithe is 10%. You know, you say, well, I'm tithing, but it's not 10%. That's ill. It, doesn't, it doesn't match up. That's like one and three are the same. They're not. But start someplace. Instead of saying, well, what? I have nothing left over at the, at the end of the month. Start saying, I'm going to commit to this. And I've watched. And there's people that are watching this and people who will be here this coming Sunday. And people who are watching this over the Internet, over YouTube, are going to say, you know, that's where I started. And what happens is as they begin to incrementally increase so they got to that full 10%. They've said, I can't believe that I was living outside of God, being able to bless. I have more than I thought ever possible because they put God first. Please hear me. This isn't scolding you. It's not about judgment. It's about the fact that I want to be faithful to my beloved ways. I am saying I care enough about you to say I want everybody to give, not because we need it, I want everybody to give because God desires your heart and he desires everything that you have. And when you give him what you have, he gives back immeasurably. So then we go through here and we see that, um, so all Judah, in verse 12 of 13, all Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storehouses. The storehouse in 21st century language is the local church where you come. Now, Nehemiah 10, 32 to 39. I'm just kind of jumping around here. So in verse 35 of, of Nehemiah 10 says, We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crop and every fruit tree. Now, I want to talk about first fruits. First fruits in the Old Testament uh, was the fact that they, they would, they, when the first fruits came out, they would offer the first fruits off the tree, and it was saying, we are honoring that this belongs to God, and it is he is the one who gives the increase, and by giving first fruits, God blesses the rest of the crop. That has been my experience as I bring my first fruits, not my leftovers, my first fruit. The Bible says that God causes the increase. And it says in verse 36, it was written in the law. Uh, and so I want to just say people sometimes get confused and they say, well, you know, we're living in grace and not under the law. That's true. It says it was written in the law. It didn't say it was the law. It says it was contained and written in the law. That was a way of saying the books of Moses. So I want you to know something. We're going to revisit this. If you're saying there, well, you know, we're under grace and not under law. That's so true. And we're going to talk about the fact that tithing is a principle and not a commandment. And you're going to say, oh, my goodness, how is he going to, how can he get away with that? I'll unpack it in a minute. So basically then they come back to this, our text, we will not neglect the house of God. Now, how did, the, how did these Israelites, how did they get into this jam? How did they get into this situation? It grew out of a lack of understanding of contributing, of the blessing of obedience, and the things being brought into order as they as a community work together. So again, uh, on January 1st, 2022, my stewardship of, of this amazing faith community called Sunshine Hills will be passed to Pastor Danny, down at Pastor Danny Jones. And my heart is that, that this church, that is the people, the ministry, all that we have stood for all these years, that it will be stable and sustainable, and this is the key. So God has a plan for your finances. That's the good news. And I want you to know something. It's good, and it's supernatural. God's plan includes provision for his church. 
And that's the way it is. So you, I have some questions. Who is your provider? I can't answer that for you. Question, what is my part and what is God's part? My part is obedience. God's part is to be faithful to what he promised. How do I, how do we walk in faith and not fear? But if I give, there won't be enough. And I want you to know either God's word is true or it's not. And I want you to know that God is saying that this is, this is a really key issue, especially in a materialistic society. Are we going to trust that God is our provider and he is going to make it work for us all? Now, all too often, this topic of tithing and giving is about condemnation and not the good news. You've heard it. You must. You should. And it's law and not love. Now, I come back to the, the debate. So I've heard people, and I, again, I wrote this book, uh, Purses with Holes, a few years ago. And uh, the thing is, we said, well, you know, it's, you know, that's the old, that's the Mosaic law. That's the Old Testament law. We're under grace. Well, the reality is that the, the concept, the principle of tithing predates Moses. And we see that when God started to deal with people and Abraham and his, uh, and his grandson Jacob says that they gave a tenth and God blessed them. So it, it's a principle. It's not a commandment. Now, let me just talk about this. So it always troubles me. And some of you hear me say this. When pastors, i.e. people like me, they go to, to Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, you know, it says, you know, test me now on this, which that's a principle. But the reality is this, that, that, that if we're going to adhere to a commandment in the Old Testament, what are the other 613 are we supposed to do? So here's where I want to come. I'm saying that, it, that giving is not a commandment. It is a principle. And the Bible says, give and it will be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, Luke chapter 6. For how you give is how it will be given to you. So it's so a commandment is outside, but a principle and a commitment and a conviction is inside. I believe that one is far more powerful than the other. So let's go back. What did Jesus say? You can disagree with me, but what did Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 22, 17 to 20, when he says, Render to Caesar, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God's what is God's. There's a very clear demarcation. Two, Matthew 23, 20. 3 to 24 it says woe to you teachers of the law you you give a tenth of your spices but you have neglected the more important matters of the law justice mercy faithfulness so again we're talking about what's really important here but here's what Jesus said you should have practiced the latter justice mercy and faithfulness without neglecting the former about rendering to God's what is God's and then Jesus said in Matthew 6 19 he says don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But, but you need to store up treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So ministry happens because people like you and me, we give. So here, here's, I want to explode some, some disinformation. So you mean the government doesn't give money to the church? I had somebody say that. Aren't you all paid by the government? No. You mean the diocese or the national church doesn't give money to operate this local church? No. Isn't the church rich? No. Again, we all benefit from years of sacrifice, obedience, and good stewardship from people who give, gave to make this ministry go forward. And we need to be careful, it says in 1 Timothy 5.18, not to muzzle the oxes that are, that are trampling the grain. We need to understand that community and 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 um, contributing are one and the same. So here's the summary, and then we're just about done. First of all, this is good news. God owns everything, and he has entrusted you. He's entrusted me to be good stewards of his resources. God has promised to increase as we walk in obedience. He has invited you and I to partner with him. We are God's conduit to provide for the physical and financial needs of his church here on this earth. Tithing is a principle. It's not a part of the Mosaic law. It is not magic. Just because I give doesn't mean that I'm automatically going to be rich. It must be married to good stewardship. And you can trust this local church with your tithes and offerings. I close with this in Nehemiah 13.10. You know, remember Tobiah from one of the earlier things that he was an Ammonite. And he ended up being in the, in, the, in the temple storehouses because the people weren't filling it with the right kind of things. He moves in. And so the question is, you know, if we're not putting the, the right kind of things in our spiritual storehouse, 
we have these Tobias and end up climbing in and they don't belong there. And part of the restoration physically was throwing him out on his ear and saying, we must restore order, sustainable and stable. So here's where we come. Stability for the house of the Lord is not just for this, but it's also his plan is for stability and sustainability in your house. And I want to leave you with this. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And then you need to understand the difference between a need and a want. But I want you to know I believe this, and I ask you to consider what we've talked about. And if this ticks you off or makes you angry or makes you feel um, condemned, you know, I would love to sit down and talk And because I, I just have no defense here. I want you to do well. Let's pray. Father, I ask that we would open our ears to hear this important message in Nehemiah. Lord, I pray against the evil one that would come to condemn. Lord, I pray that people who maybe say, I don't know how to make this work, that they would just start with just seed money and just say, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to invest this in the kingdom and see and watch what God does. I just pray against condemnation. And Lord, we believe that you are the one who provides for your church. And we are trusting for stability and sustainability for Sunshine Hills. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quick, if you, if you don't know Jesus, you can say, well, that's not a, a salvation message. Well, absolutely it is, because God cares for you. He's got a plan for you, for every aspect of your life. And it starts by saying, I can't do this in my own strength. Jesus died for me. He rose from the dead to prove that he was God. And as I invite him into my life, instead of doing this on my own, I have Jesus with me. So, Lord, if there's anybody that's making a commitment for faith this morning, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just flood them with your grace and that they would have the good news that you plan and your plan and your purposes for them is to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. So I have the privilege um, of leading us in this wonderful um, ordinance, something that Jesus said, I want you to do this. Um, and I was thinking, you know, uh, I'm getting quite nostalgic that, you know, as the times of my being able to lead this congregation as lead pastor in this amazing thing called communion, that those times are coming to a close. I'm going to continue to be part of here and whatever, but I want to just say uh, Jesus in uh, John 13, he said he knew that his hour had come, his time had come. And he says, in having loved them, those that were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. We just got done talking about, in, in you know, laying down our life in service of others. Well, Jesus did that. And so we, we have in our hands, whether you're at home and you've got a cup or whatever, I hope that you have the elements. We, I have one of these. But we hold in our hands something very, very precious. That it's a tangible reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. I think sometimes we can be a little flippant. Sometimes I can be a little bit flippant about this thing. And yet Jesus felt it was so important. He said, I want you to do this until I come again. So there's something about this in Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. It's easy for us to, to kind of uh, segment that. But his body, broken, it wasn't just a metaphor, but within a few hours of him saying that, that he was beaten beyond recognition, um, cruel thor uh, crown of thorns thrust on his head and him nailed to the cross. And that it says that he himself bore our iniquities and our sorrows and our shame. And so Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And as often as you eat this bread, you remember my death until I come again. So I'm going to encourage you, if you can, you can take that, 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 that way for whatever it is, if, a, if it's a cracker or whatever it is, I want to just encourage you to, to take it. And, and I want you to really think about the fact that Jesus died for you. It wasn't just a story. It was reality. And it has such spiritual significance. And our unity was one on that cross. Our being part of the same body was one on that cross. And in his subsequent resurrection, let's pray. Jesus, as I hold in my hands, Lord, this remembrance of you, how much you loved us. It says, in having loved them, he loved them to the uttermost. The old King James says, and it says, he showed them the fullest extent of his love. He didn't stop short. 
He didn't just show us the Father, but he completed his mandate and his mission to be the sacrifice for our sins and the sins of the whole world. So Jesus, we remember your death. We remember that you died for us, that we can live. And as we partake of this, Lord, we pray that we partake to ourselves your life in Jesus' name. And now I ask you to break it in half. Let's eat it. Let's do it in remembrance of Jesus. The Bible says in the same way he took the cup and when he had blessed it, he said, this is the, the blood of my new covenant which is offered for you. And um, we, this goes right back to the very beginning of, the, of God's promise of restoration. It says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sins. So Jesus gave his life's blood so that you and I could be made new. He says but the, that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. So right now, I'm going to just lead us in prayer. This isn't just something we do to elongate the service, but let's say, Lord, we come into your presence right now and we thank you that you forgave us our sins, that as far as the east is from the west, that's how far you've removed our sin, that it says your blood cleanses us from all sin. And as we hold in our hand this representation of the blood of Jesus, the most precious commodity in, in this universe and beyond, it is the currency of eternity. We thank you and we praise you. As we drink of this cup, we remember that you died for us and that you have forgiven us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to not just go through this, but, Lord, that it'll make a difference to, and that one day we're going to eat and drink anew with you in glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.